but when you look at the source of that racial inequality, you almost always end up at housing discrimination, housing segregation, um, which is say you, you almost always end up at land use, always end up at zoning. Um, these are the mechanisms, not just by which sort of white middle class uh, wealth is being created, but on the flip side, they're the mechanisms by which uh, racial inequality has been sustained over the course of the last uh, century. And they sort of inform all sorts of disparities in the society. All right, so there are about 100, 100 of us here now, and um, I, I want to get started. Um, Thank you everybody who, who donated and who came. We are so excited to have you. My name is Leora Tonwatko Ross. I work for the Housing Leadership Council of San Mateo County. Our mission is to work with communities and their leaders to create and preserve quality affordable homes. My personal housing story, why I'm a housing activist is because uh, after I moved home from college, I uh, moved back with my grandmother who happened to own property here in the Bay Area. And then after that, when I got married, I moved in with my husband and his parents. And um, there is this generational wealth transfer that happens um, for people who's, who were fortunate and privileged and blessed enough to be born to people who bought property 30 years ago. Um, and it's incredibly unfair and unequal. Um, and, and I feel a sense of stability that is... Um, that is really nice, um, but I know that not everybody feels that. And, and I can only imagine how uh, people feel who are, uh, have disabilities or whose, whose parents were by matter of policy locked out of home ownership um, for, for generations in our country. Um, and I, I feel an immense responsibility to help fix that. Um, and, I, and I stand here as the recipient of, of white privilege and um, land use policy that is incredibly broken. Um, and so I, I, want to, I want to have us think about that tonight. We're very lucky tonight to be joined by Jamel Bowie, who is uh, a New York Times writer and a political analyst for CBS. We are also very lucky to have council member Rick Bonilla here. Um, I looked up his bio in preparation for tonight and it's about three pages long. Uh, so in the interest of time, I'm going to um, read a little bit about, about who he is and what he does. He is a current council member for the city of San Mateo. Uh, he sits on a bag in a bunch of different committees. Um, he is on the heart board in San Mateo County. He's on the Peninsula Clean Energy Board. Um, but also he is such an inspiration to me personally as a, as a political leader. He's never scared to stand up for what's right, to say the unpopular thing. He gives a voice to people who are not traditionally um, in positions of power. That's my piece. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Council Member Bonilla, take it away. Well, I want to thank you very much, Leroy, for the really glowing uh, introduction there for that. Well, okay. Thank you very much, though. So, um, Measure P is what we're here to talk about tonight. And Measure P is a measure that came about as Measure H back in 1991, when a group of people who lived in San Mateo, including Senator Hill and Claire, Net Claire Mack and some other people who were, became prominent around that time, um, saw tall buildings going on, what they thought were tall buildings. And they were basically 12 and 14 story buildings, some 10 story buildings. And um, they felt that that was out of character for the neighborhood. And that's gonna come up in some questions uh, following. Um, clearly they were different. It was new, it was buildings for the future. And, but they decided they didn't like it. They put forth this measure that would live in height and density. And so the governing limitations since then uh, and uh, uh, has been for in general throughout the city, no more than uh, 55 feet high, which is about five stories and uh, 50 units per acre, which is minuscule density for per acre uh, habitation on um, land use in, in a city 
that is uh, growing between San Francisco and San Jose, where the, the two urban giants are growing together. Um, we've been living through change already now for the past 50 years. It's way different than when I was a kid on the peninsula. And now it's time to grow up and move on. So that's why we're here. We want to fight for the ability to build what people need to be able to live in a healthy way, uh, in a way that works with transit. And so we have this ballot measure they put on to renew it for 10 years it's called Measure. It's Measure P right now. I don't know what it'll be called, but they want to extend it for another 10 years. That's why we're here. And we need to defeat it because we need to be able to build what younger generation needs for the future. And we have to clean up our air and we have to clean up uh, 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 congestion issues on our streets and we have to use less water. We have to do all the right things. Cut greenhouse gas emissions, use renewable energy, and I'm on top of all those things, um, as you would see in my bio. But anyway, I'm here now, uh, since it is indeed almost time to introduce our guest. Um, we will be uh, mounting an effort in opposition to this measure. It, it is going to be placed on the ballot by the council. We voted to do that, I think the final uh, action is going to be on uh, at the next council meeting on that and um, mostly because we have an obligation under the law as council members we had to do that um, nobody expressed any great affection for it uh, during the time when we discussed it um, it's it's something that I feel and I can't speak for other council members but in my opinion it's been holding us back for a long time and it has led to um, uh, inequitable situations for people who live in San Mateo. Okay, there we go. I see our guest tonight, Mr. Jamel Bowie. Welcome. Uh, how are you? Great, I'm great. I'm Rick Bonilla. Thank you. I want to welcome you uh, to our uh, event tonight, the fundraiser, Segregation Then and Now. And <laughs> I, have a, I have a brief bio that I got of you, but um, and I'll just shoot that. And if you want to add anything to it, then please feel free. As far as my bio, you can just say I, I'm a columnist for the New York Times. That's really that's really all that's needed. There we go. And so it's been done. Great. Thank you. <laughs> that's such a flex. I love it. <laughs> yeah, well, right. no, it's the the you know I have a bio written up somewhere, but it's always so long, and I feel very embarrassed hearing it. And so it's just like my job title's enough. <laughs> that makes it much easier. So. Um, and really what's important here is going to be our discussion tonight. So I welcome you and thank you from the great distance. I think you're in Virginia right now. That's great. Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, well, thank you all for having me. I'm really happy uh, to do this. Um, I think I was asked to say again, a few words about, um, you know, exclusionary zoning and equity and, and segregation. And um, I'm going to, what I'm going to do and, I'm not going to spend too much time talking um, or monologuing, but what I'm going to do is first kind of give my general thoughts on um, the connection between those things I see and then give uh, some background on segregation and zoning in the Bay Area, which is relevant to all of this. Um, so a friend of mine has a uh, saying he likes. Um, he does a lot of work around racial inequality. And he likes to say that there is housing segregation in everything. Um, that when you look across inequality in this country, inequality is, uh, is highly racialized. There's a, a vast wealth gap between African Americans and whites, Hispanics and whites, um, some Asian American groups and white Americans. Uh, but when you look at the source of that racial inequality, you almost always end up at housing discrimination, housing segregation. Um, which is say you, you almost always end up at land use, always end up at zoning. Um, these are the mechanisms, not just by which sort of white middle class uh, wealth is being created, but on the flip side, they're the mechanisms by which uh, racial inequality has been sustained over the course of the last uh, century. And they sort of inform all sorts of disparities in the society. So to give like a, a couple examples uh one that i one of one of which is a hobby course of mine um you know high levels of homicide victimization among african americans for example is pretty much a direct function of segregation you have segregated neighborhoods you have neighborhood these segregated neighborhoods have high levels of poverty because of historic disinvestment um, and they end up being starved of the resources necessary to control 
uh, violence within them. And you get these high rates of homicide victimization. Um, land use over time has uh, produced these uh, high rates of violence, which then have all these other sort of downstream effects. Relevant to the current period, uh, high levels of exposure to pollution, um, high rates of asthma and other respiratory diseases among African Americans and Hispanics, Hispanic Americans, again, is, a, is very much a function of segregation, a function of zoning, of land use, that, that in cities and small towns and places across the country, uh, uh, political officials placed factories, placed highways uh, in neighborhoods belonging uh, to non-whites um, because they were segregated, because they were on the outskirts. And that contributes to these high rates of disease. And in the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, as I think we all know at this point, um, they have produced uh, disproportionate deaths and infections among those groups. Um, again, a straight line, more or less, from uh, land use to these uh, material inequalities. Um, so this is generally true across the country, but it's specifically true of the Bay Area as well. Uh, San Francisco was among the first cities in the nation to have a racially exclusionary zoning ordinance. Um, in 1890, an ordinance that sought to exclude Chinese Americans from certain um, parts of the city. Uh, this was invalidated, but it didn't really stop anyone. Uh, the next couple of decades would be sort of a case study and a devoted effort to keep uh, Chinese immigrants, Chinese Americans, African Americans, uh, Mexican Americans out of desirable places of San Francisco, of Berkeley, of San Mateo. Um, in 1916, Berkeley in particular passed its very first zoning ordinance. Um, motivating officials and residents and real estate agents was racial exclusion. And this was an attempt that these early zoning restrictions or um, early zoning ordinances were attempt to place uh, restrictions that had previously been present in uh, covenants in um, sort of private agreements, institutionalize them, make them just part of the political landscape. Um, and it, it's interesting, it, sort of within a decade of that first ordinance, California realtors would basically be celebrating its effect, um, uh, celebrating uh, Berkeley's ability to, and this is a quote, organize a, a district of some, uh, of some 20 blocks under the covenant plan as protection against invasion of Negroes and Asiatics. So uh, in addition to being um, explicitly racially exclusionary, Berkeley's 1916 ordinance was also one of the first in the country to establish uh, zones specifically, specifically for single family zoning, for single family housing rather. And this was understood at the time to be very much a way to get Chinese Americans specifically um, out of the cities, out of the neighborhoods, because um, they lived in apartment buildings uh, more than they lived in single family homes. And, and this is another quote, apartment house, houses uh, were the bane to the owner of single family dwellings. They would, uh, they would um, reduce the value of the homes um, and they would re reduce the value of the homes because they brought, uh, and this is another quote, I'm not just making this one up. Um, they brought the quote, heathen Chinese into their midst. So like no one was, no one was uh, shy about this. This was all very, on the explicit, people understood what they were doing when they wrote these ordinances and put them in the law. Now, the Supreme Court around the same time in the, I think, 1917, um, would rule that explicitly racial zoning was un unconstitutional. Um, but there was a loophole. This court said that you can't, you can't say in your laws that you're banning blacks or, or Chinese or anyone from living in a place. What you can do is have zoning as long as it had a relation to the public health, the safety, uh, the morals, or the general welfare of the city. And so the zoning that emerged very much our modern zoning um, of separate uses, of setbacks, of single family zoning, of height restrictions, uh, was understood at the time to be a, a backdoor around uh, explicit racial exclusion. And everywhere it was used, whether the Bay Area or whether in uh, the Midwest, in Detroit, for example, um, uh, localities, cities uh, use, or, sorry, in Michigan, 
in one of which in the city of Detroit and other surrounding areas, um, officials use zoning to basically cordon off African Americans coming to the city for wartime jobs. Ever it was used, it was used very much to keep racial others out. Um, and so, you know, in the Bay Area specifically, as demographics change in response to migration, in response to, again, um, the economic incentives created by the First World War, uh, planners in the entire area use zoning to ensure that middle-class whites would not have to live near blacks, would not have to live near Chinese, Chinese Americans, would not have to live near uh, immigrants or the poor in general. Um, and sort of the extent to which the Bay Area remains segregated by class and race um, is a direct result of these choices made a century ago, made 80 years ago. Uh, there's a great uh, national study of zoning and segregation that came out in 2018, um, and in it, uh, it's the author finds that uh, cities which are early adopters of zoning ordinances grew to be 10% more segregated over the following 50 years than those which weren't early adopters. Um, and those cities also had more unequal uh, sort of property values that the, the wealthy owners, uh, their homes are worth much more than those of middle income or low income owners. Um, th this is sort of all to say that uh, when we're thinking about zoning and its effects, um, the origins really matter and the original intent of zoning policies have to be understood in the context of the racial politics of the early 20th century, of the um, uh, sort of elite obsession with maintaining an Anglo-Saxon nation, with the rise of eugenics and sort of eugenic thinking in the American elite class. And all of this converged with sort of the emerging science of land use, economics, of zoning um, to produce uh, specifically um, racist racial outcomes. So it's obviously the case that most advocates of exclusionary zoning measures today aren't thinking of what they're doing in these sorts of explicitly racial terms. I live in Charlottesville, Virginia. Um, Charlottesville is, I wanna say 55% of the city is zoned for single family homes. Um, there are quite a few people who strenuously believe that this should remain the case. And no one would say that uh, we're doing this to keep out African-Americans, which are the, the predominant racial minority in the town. But since the implementation of exclusionary zoning in Charlottesville in the middle of the 20th century, since the further down zoning of Charlottesville in the early 1990s, the population of African-Americans has steadily declined from a high of about 45, 46% to where it is now about 19% and the migration is ongoing. Um, and that's because uh, even if justifications for exclusionary zoning are attenuated from their racist origins, the effects remain. Um, by mandating that the only kind of things you can build are the expensive housing, by mandating um, against apartments, against duplexes, triplexes, any more affordable housing, you are essentially um, ensuring that racial disparities of wealth, of income, are the things that determine whether or not someone can live in a place. Um, and so where there's exclusionary zoning, there is high levels of racial inequality. Um, where there's exclusionary zoning, there are cities and neighborhoods uh, that are losing uh, populations that may have been there historically but can no longer afford uh, to live there. And so, you know, not just where it currently exists, but it, if you are going to double down on that, if you're going to um, uh, further down zone, if you're going to you know, uh, implement new height restrictions, um, even if you include uh, provisions for affordable housing, even if you include um, uh, things that can mitigate the effect, the overall context in which this is happening is one in which um, uh, racial inequality is maintained um, through strict ex exclusionary zoning. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that is my 
take on that. Uh, I think the last thought I have um, is that if exclusionary zoning is one of the mechanisms um, by which we have created disparities of wealth and opportunity, and if it is one of the things that continues to sustain them, um, then if you want to strike a blow for equity, it's not going to be going to solve everything. Um, there's still going to be deep problems everywhere. But one of the important steps we can take is basically opening up our cities for people to live in them, um, for people to be able to build affordable forms of housing, um, for people uh, to be able to uh, reside um, where it makes sense for them to reside versus having to make their choices based on what's allowed, um, what, uh, what's what been restricted. Um, yeah, so let's do some questions. Great, thank you very much uh, for that uh, history. Um, and it's exactly right on for us here in the Bay Area about how uh, uh, the way we are came to be. We were strictly zoned to create winners and losers. And it continues today, even though nobody can see any form of racism behind it as it's working, it right. works that way because that's how it was created, what it was made to do. So thank you very much for, for bringing us uh, up to date on that. Uh, it's a history that not many people really know around here. And uh, we've been working to try and spread that truth, but it takes time. So thank you very much. Um, so on the questions, uh, we took questions from uh, attendees and participants. And one wrote, how do we talk to white people about segregation? Um, so um, let me just add a little local context to that. And uh, uh, knowing that we're going to be reaching out to voters in San Mateo and the broader public seeking support in opposition to the ballot measure, which will be in November, um, maintaining the current height and density limits for another 10 years. They've already been in place for 30 years. Um, and a member of the public submitted this question. And so, you know, knowing that there is privilege, there is exclusion, many people think that at the core of it all is racism. Okay, people who are informed, who have struggled with this situation, you know, feel that at the core of it, uh, there is a racism. And we know this to be true. Um, so uh, we've recently written about, you have recently written about, about whiteness as property. And I saw that in one of your writings that I just read last night. And it inspired me to ask you, uh, uh, because it becomes like a sort of a, a, a brand. It's, it's uh, the existence of privilege and gives you access to things that people otherwise don't get access to. Um, so I wondered if you could maybe talk a little bit about whiteness as property right? Uh, or poverty. Whiteness as, um, I'm sorry, I wrote about whiteness, yeah, and property. Okay, yeah. referring to my notes here, a little rough. Um, and I see a connection between property and poverty too. So can you expand on that a little bit? Sure. Um, I mean, I think the, the idea which comes from a legal scholar named Cheryl Harris uh, is that you can think of sort of white racial identity as both, you know, being like any identity, but also in American society, um, having the properties of property. Uh, it's something that the government has uh, uh, created investments in. Um, it's something that the, that sort of the legal uh, apparatus um, protects uh, over the course of American history. So there are famous cases, right, about um, immigrants uh, from, you know, India, from various countries trying to claim um, or stake a claim on whiteness, understanding that it gets access uh, not just a sort of equal citizenship, but to very concrete material things like capital, um, like uh, the a credit, like the ability to um, be a full participant in the market. And that's, that's sort of the, the thing in the column um, I was trying to, to get at, that you can understand, you know, there's a lot of conversation, people, people talk a lot about privilege and such, and I sort of get that and I, I sort of see the utility, but I think th those kind of conversations can often lead to this kind of like metaphysical place. It isn't very, you know, uh, I don't necessarily think is super productive, um, that it begins to sort of divorce um, racism from what are actual material stakes. And if I were, you know, the, the original question is how would I talk to white people about segregation? Um, I wouldn't talk about it in terms of privilege necessarily. 
Um, because I don't think seg segregation, racial segregation may create the illusion of advantage. Um, but in reality, segregated societies are brittle societies. They're ones with high levels of inequality that leave them vulnerable um, to all sorts of social problems. And if I'm talking to a white audience about segregation, my argument is that segregation isn't just bad for African Americans or any other racial minority. Segregation is bad for you too. It's bad uh, for your kids. Your kids are not going to grow up in the kind of, um, of tolerant, uh, open-minded society you might want if it's a segregated society. It's bad for uh, the ability of your city, of your town, of your state, of your country to grow and thrive. Um, that the the sort of the uh, separation of people, segregation of people, the maintenance and the entrenchment of racial inequality in the end only pays negative dividends for everyone. Um, and so that's that's why you want to get rid of it. Um, it I, I can't make anyone feel any kind of way about you know their feelings, but I can say that uh, trying to make the country and the society less unequal um, is something that will benefit us all. And that the sort of one of the vehicles for that inequality, one of the important ones is segregation. Great. That's a great answer. Thank you very much. Really appreciate that. Um, uh, some have recently argued, here's the next question. Some have recently argued that density has created more of a problem during the coronavirus pandemic. How can cities do density right while being a healthy and climate friendly choice for cities? Um, and please ad address the difference between density and overcrowding. Yeah, I mean, I'm not a planner or anything, so I can't give any like specific recommendations. Um, I can observe, right, that the countries that have done best handling um, the pandemic, uh, Taiwan, uh, South Korea, uh, Germany even, are relatively dense places. It doesn't seem that there's much of a correlation between density and the ability to handle this, but overcrowding is a real problem. Um, that when there's not enough housing for people, such that they have to be stacked on top of each other uh, in uh, units not made for, you know, four people in a unit for two people, eight people in a unit for four people, um, those kinds of conditions that and we, we can see this, you know, throughout time um, are bad for people's health. And so that I think is the, <laughs> that's the, you know, that's the way to think about it, that density, um, uh, having a lot of people living on a single plot of land um, is fine because you can build in ways that people have plenty of space if they're not crowded. But if you are not building, if you are restricting housing um, and people are still coming and people still need to work and they still need to live, uh, if you're facilitating overcrowding, then you're gonna run into a problem and it's gonna be much more difficult to address. I mean to sort of give a, a counter example, the other kind of big COVID-19 outbreaks in the United States are happening um, in Midwestern towns where there are big meatpacking uh, factories. And they're happening in neighborhoods which are not dense by New York or San Francisco or Chicago styles, but are quite crowded um, because there's just not enough housing for people and people are, are making do with what they have. Uh, and that's the danger. Great, thank you. Um, you connected those dots very nicely um, because we do have some of that here in San Mateo, overcrowding. And um, we believe that, you know, providing some density so that people can have their own space, you know, a, 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 a decent number of people per living unit would make a huge difference. And the affordability in our case would come from increasing the density per acre. So right. thank you very much. So we hear about neighborhood character a lot. One of the things the, uh, the people who are you know, promoting uh, maintaining the height and density restrictions talk a lot about, well, you know, this kind of density and these heights really you know, wreck our neighborhood character. We're a quaint uh, you know, village. We're um, a lot of these historical uh, character, those kind of uh, um, descriptors that they use. Um, so can you please comment on how these dog whistles, okay, if you will, um, are used to shape cityscapes and how they're increasingly making our cities unlivable by filling our streets with cars, our air with pollution, wasting precious water on uh, park-like uh, lawns and other settings while limiting space for our kids, our grandkids, our grandparents, 
our lower wage working people to live. I mean, I feel like the question just answered itself, right? Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, so I, I mentioned I live in Charlottesville, Virginia, um, town of about 50,000 people, relatively dense for being a college town in the middle of Virginia. Um, and we're struggling with a lot of the same issues that y'all are in San Mateo. And often you will hear um, in response to proposals to build um, apartment apartments for uh, you know, young people, small units, you know, uh, or, or complexes for um, disabled people that, you know, this just, just doesn't fit with the character of the neighborhood. And it very clearly is uh, a deflection. It is sort of relying on people's bias for stasis to block things that uh, oftentimes, in my experience at least, don't really have that kind of impact. I think there is I'm not gonna say that there is no such thing as neighborhood character. I think that is a thing, but it's often associated with less density or, or, or proposing more density is a thing that affects it, which I, I just don't think is the case. So to use an example from like literally my block, um, down the street, we have a bunch of, you know, little bungalows built in the 50s and 60s, nice homes. Um, and the area is zoned only for single family homes. If you wanted to build a duplex or a triplex, which would make a lot of sense, which could get you know three families uh, onto a single lot at like low cost and could be done in a way to fit the aesthetics of the area, um, you couldn't do that, that's illegal. That would be against the character of the neighborhood. But if you were to tear down one of those bungalows and build like a four story single family home, like some sort of McMansion, that's fine. Even if it's out of character with the neighborhood. Um, literally, it just, there's nothing like that there at all. And I think the fact that, you know, uh, the fact that that is the legal reality of building on that street. Um, and the fact that if you were to propose the triplex, there would be neighbors to say that you know, we don't want that there, it's, not, it's out of character. Um, two things that reflects how zoning, strict zoning can often lead to kind of absurd uh, outcomes. Uh, and it also, I think, reveals, um, or sort of, I said earlier uh, in my sort of initial spiel that arguments for restrictive zoning are usually attenuated from their origins in you know, racist and classist exclusionary actions, but not always. And often I think the character argument is brought out to allow people to express desire to, I don't wanna live near lower income people. I don't wanna live near um, uh, people of color in ways that are more polite and that have some plausible deniability. Right, thank you. And what we hear a lot is because we have the bay between us and the East Bay, they don't have to live here. They could go over the bridge and live over right. there. Right. Yeah, that's that kind of thinking. Okay, great, thank you for that. Next question is, what are the implications of us returning to a renter's society? So we're currently facing an economic downturn. Right. Yeah. It's, that's like an interesting bit of speculation because I'm not, there are certainly going to be more renters. That's, I think, I don't, I don't think you can question that. But I think this will still be a society where many, many people who um, live in a place, own their own place. Because outside of, you know, outside of uh, uh, more dense cities, outside of kind of the most desirable places on the coast or in the interior, you, tens of millions of Americans, hundreds of millions of Americans uh, live in places where housing isn't prohibitively expensive, right? Um, where you can, you can buy a home um, for, you know, some reasonable amount of money and, you know, live in it and thrive in it. So I'm not sure we're going to become a society of renters, but we will have more renters. And what I would hope to happen is that renters begin to understand themselves as constituting sort of like an, an, an interest in society, begin to vote and you know participate politically in ways that would enhance the status and the the security of renters. Um, that still hasn't happened. I, I have yet to live in a place where there's been sort of organized renters um, working to uh, better themselves. But if we are gonna, if we are heading towards a society where there are more people are renting, where fewer people have an ownership stake in the society, then maybe that is a thing um, that gets people to see themselves as uh, having an interest that can be acted on politically. 
Right, and I agree with you. In my experience throughout most of my life, lots of political activity. Renters just don't organize. But we're seeing the beginning of it here in the Bay Area, in Oakland, where there's a huge issue with homelessness. Some renters groups have, or some actual homeless groups and low-income groups, have actually uh, uh, taken possession, you know, physically of a couple of homes. And they actually got movement out of the city of Oakland and the owners of the property. So there's a spark there, a beginning, and yeah. I think hope for those issues to you know, rise farther to the top of the list of things that need to be dealt with. So right. that comment. Um, so that leads into this. How do we shift voting power from single family neighborhoods to all of those who haven't been voting? Yeah, <laughs> uh, that's like a $20 million question, right? Uh, uh, I mean, it's, it's so much of this. So think about owning a home, right? We, we just bought this house uh, last year. Uh, and the thing about owning a home is that just the process of doing it, of, of applying for a mortgage or of searching for a home, of applying for a mortgage, of, of meeting your neighbors and doing all this thing kind of impresses on you this identity of, of homeowner in addition to everything in the society that does the same as well. So even if you come into this, um, like I did, for instance, kind of skeptical of home ownership. It's hard not to, once you do it, be like, oh yeah, I own a home and this is part of my identity. And maybe it's a part of my political identity as well. Um, and that thing, I mean, you could call that like a, a form of class consciousness, right? That sort of in the process of doing this thing, you gain these forms of knowledge that kind of reveal your relationship to, you know, the capital you own, the, the, the city, the neighborhood you live in, and influence you politically. Um, and so to, to answer the question of how do we sort of uh, get people who aren't single family homeowners to vote and act politically in ways that represent their interests, I think is we have to figure out ways in which that kind of process can happen for people who don't own homes, right? That they can uh, either through being organized, through whatever i'm i'm not an organizer i just you know, a writer i think um uh, don't don't not too good at organizing but i think if you can devise some kind of similar experience um for people who do not own but who have to live somewhere then you can begin to change the politics of all of this um and i think you in in much the same way that you know i'm gonna thinking big picture that you know progressive policy both relies on you know, ordinary working people, but also middle-class people who see themselves uh, as having some sort of interest with people who aren't as fortunate as them. I think homeowners who are not happy with how homeownership um, and how single family homeownership dominates politics so much have to act in ways to loosen that dominance. They have to be class traders of a sorts. Um, and, and work to um, work for more density, work for more affordable housing, understanding that, yeah, maybe their, the value of their home isn't going to go up so quickly, but they'll be building um, a neighborhood, a city that is more inclusive and welcoming uh, for everyone. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I really appreciate that. It seems like with uh, a feeling of um, um, being considered uh, a part of, right? Realizing right. that you actually own a part of this city, right? And that's, you know, I'm a city councilman here in San Mateo. And, you know, when I speak, I don't speak about, well, the voters say, or well, the homeowners say, <clears throat> I always speak in terms of the residents, okay? Because we are all equal in terms of representation, right? right. And I seek to lift everybody up in the same boat, right? Uh, and give everybody the same consideration. And I think that, um, if people can feel that they actually are part of and they own and they have a decisions to make, you know, in determining where and who and how we're going to be in the future that they're really going to be listened to, then right. I think they can be organized easier. The only other way is through pain. People tend to organize when they feel enough pain. Okay. Yeah. And we don't want to go that way. Okay. That's a harder <laughs> way to go. 
So I want to prevent the pain. Thank you very much for that comment. So Rick, we have a question that has been asked a couple times in the in the live Q and A, and I and this one I sort of personally want to know, so I'm going to ask it. How do we bridge the gap between anti gentrification activists? and anti-exclusionary housing policy advocates to build a coherent coalition against inequality. Um, and I don't know how familiar you are with the housing politics of the Bay Area, um, but there is, it, it's, there's a housing advocates on both sides, right? Um, right. Anti-market rate um, and, and anti-everything. Um, so what, what do you say to that? This is the thing. I mean, this is, I, I don't have any particular strategies. I'm just, I'm trying to put myself in the position of someone. If I were reaching out to someone who um, is primarily an anti gentrification uh, ad advocate and is sort of suspicious of developers, um, rightly so, oftentimes, I would try to find points of connection and experience to, to use Charlottesville as an example again um, uh, there are developers who want to build here who want to build sort of missing middle housing uh, there are anti-gentrification advocates there are people fighting for affordable housing and they often find themselves at cross purposes but I think in recent years um, they've come to see that they're facing some of the same obstacles that the same kinds of red tape and barriers to um, revitalizing uh, a public housing complex also exist to make it very difficult to build a duplex. Um, that they may at some point down the line find themselves against each other, but for the basics of what they're trying to do, which is just build more housing, they may have common cause. And I, I'm a firm believer that in these kinds of uh, political contests and these kinds of struggle that uh, if you can find um, a point at which there is a common concrete material or inter material interest, um, if you can kind of look past uh, things that, you know, I wouldn't call them superficial, but um, aren't related to those very concrete things, then maybe you can begin to build coalitions that are not guaranteed to last, um, but can make progress in ways that satisfy everyone. Because there are, right, there are actually, as, as far as I understand it, everywhere that's struggling with building more homes, there are, con there are barriers that the pro more homes side faces, <laughs> um, regardless of where they're coming in at it, if they're just trying, if they're trying to build uh, uh, not-for-profit housing if they're trying to build for-profit housing. Um, uh, there are barriers that all sides hit. And so that is, I think, a starting place for building coalitions. And maybe in that process of working together to get rid of those very basic barriers, um, you can come to deeper understandings on all sides that can produce more durable coalitions for the future. Thank you. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I have another question here. Uh, <clears throat> do you think that taking an explicit anti-racist -race, bent on the campaign would be successful in San Mateo? I don't know about San San Mateo. Right? I don't. I don't. Um, I don't live there. But um, I think this is all very incoherent. This is not, I want everyone listening to this that I'm kind of like reasoning through this. It's just an idea I've had recently. Um, I think people underestimate. So let me, let me back up. It is easy to make fun of woke people. Um, it's sometimes kind of fun to make fun of woke people that the, the very earnest um, uh, kind of uh, rhetorical anti-racism uh, is a thing that is an easy target. But I think people underestimate the extent to which that earnest rhetorical anti-racism can be a pathway to building political coalitions. That it's, it's in, in, in sort of the, in the history of the United States, it is actually very unusual to have this many white people, frankly, interested 
in anti-racism, even if it's a rhetorical interest. Um, and so I think that if you have a population of people who have come to see racism as not just something that's regrettable, but as something that is a real serious problem for the society, even if their understanding isn't where you'd want it to be. I do think that becomes an avenue for uh, political growth. It's a way you can hook people and say, you care about this thing. And right now you care about it in terms of say Donald Trump. But here's how the racism you think is bad is affecting all these other aspects of your life, of your neighbor's life, of, of the lives of the people around you. And so I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't, I don't necessarily, I wouldn't necessarily say this is the only way to do this sort of thing, but I wouldn't dismiss it either. I do think that anti-racism, um, precisely because it speaks to basic values of fairness and equity, um, is the kind of thing that can bring people, different kinds of people together. Um, not just because of, again, this sort of, this emerging kind of cultural thing, but also because it's, you, can, you can tie so much together under the rubric. Um, this is kind of to move away from housing and just like politics in general, in general, right? Um, if you, you can, you know, you can say anti racism is the reason that your, you know, your kids speaking to an African American family are, are face greater threats from police violence, right? Anti racism right. or racism is the reason that, you know, your family can't immigrate into this country, right? Racism is the reason that, you know, your, uh, uh, the, these reactionaries got elected to office and have gutted unions, right? So you, you can pull lots of things together under the rubric. And I think that's kind of a powerful thing that's worth exploring. Great, thank you. So I think we have time for maybe another question from the audience. Do we have one? There's so many. I'm kind of working with Laura to see. The gentrification one was asked by so many people. We had to... Um, the most provocative one was, do you, do you believe that people should have no say in the qualities of the neighborhood that they live in? Which sounds like a troll question. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll answer it. Um, I don't believe that people should have no say, but I think that that say should be balanced against the interests of the community at large. So I don't think someone, I don't, I don't think a group of neighbors who happen to feel passionately about trying to, you know, uh, keep shadows off of the, off of the street should be dispositive in determining a land use decision. I don't think they should be ignored, but um, uh, I do think that there has to be a balancing and that the balancing off far, far too often leans against, you know, build homes for people and towards, you know, keep things the same. And, and the thing is keeping things the same has not worked. Um, it has been destructive for cities across the country. And do you have a good example of a model of, of what you're trying to talk about that balance between oh, no, current <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, do I have a good example? I don't, I don't, I don't know. Um, I don't know that I do. I don't know that I do. I mean, my, you know, in, in my sort of little area, um, my experience is very much with a process that gives a lot of weight to small vocal minorities. Yeah. Um, and, and it's not as, and it does not involve as much responsiveness when it comes to thinking about the big picture, but that's changed. I don't want to slag on Charlotte's well, that's changing here. Um, there are, uh, there are many people who are coming to recognize that real changes have to be done. And some of those people have even been elected, um, to office. So things are moving. Um, but I, I don't have any, you know, model off the top of my head here. Um, we have another question from a, an organizer and a political power player who lives in East Palo Alto. Um, how, to bring, how do we bring equity to the process that enables people of color and low income communities to remain with increased development? I think that for a lot of communities, negotiating with developers is the only tool they have. Right. Um, and, and what we see in East Palo Alto and Menlo Park is that people are zoning all of their housing in the black neighborhood or all right. of their office, you know, Facebook goes directly into the black neighborhood and the white neighborhoods are untouched. How do we fix that? 
I mean, that, that really, I think, is, that gets to sort of this basic question of political power. Like, it happens because the affluent homeowners in that, those white neighborhoods, even, even if they're not explicitly flexing their muscle, other stakeholders understand that they can. And so the only countervailing force there is organized political power in the other direction. And in the meantime, this is why I'm not, you know, I'm not sort of a rigid, you know, um, opponent of, uh, things like, you know, communities trying to extract um, uh, benefits and gains from developers when they build something. Because as long as um, there's this dis imbalance of political power, um, there are only so many tools those communities have to, to assist themselves. Uh, and so in, in, in thinking in terms of like a lo the long-term project of sort of just building more housing, um, it is kind of challenging and building a countervailing force to affluent homeowners such that um, they can't just be an implacable wall to um, to building in their neighborhoods. Uh, yeah, that's, that's not the most detailed answer, but it's sort of the best one I, I have. And I, I think our hope, our eternal hope, is that renters and, and low-income communities can come together and defeat that brick wall of white supremacy and home ownership, essentially. Laura, you wanna take us, you wanna wrap us up? Um, yeah, I mean, as, as an organizer, uh, this was incredible. Um, and I think that when people who see themselves as authors lend their voice to causes that they think are important and help uh, draw attention to the political issues that they believe matter, it is, uh, it, it, you know, it keeps organizers going. It really means a huge amount to us on a personal level. Um, and all the people who tuned in, you know, I consider you all organizers too, um, because after this, you know, as you heard, right, how do we get out of this? It's going to take building that culture coalition and getting people active and excited and that's this campaign and that's every campaign that's going to come after this um, because when you start with a pre-segregated society when you're starting with policies that reinforce that segregation it's going to take all of us you thinking creatively and fighting and educating people and building the pro-housing movement in order to unwind that complicated and reinforcing ball of yarn because segregation is poisoning us at every single level. Um, I want to encourage people afterwards to donate to the campaign. There will be a follow-up email, have ways to donate to the campaign. We're going to encourage you to become a member and support the work going on with Housing Leadership Council San Mateo and Yimby action and peninsula for everyone thank you so much jamal for talking about this issue and to everyone who was able to tune in tonight 